something from this that you can take away that will help you. And, um, and I know that um, whenever I go anywhere, it, it's fun for me because I even, I talk to the techs at each program and I say, hey, when, when I learn something from them, I, I go up to them and say, hey, I just learned something new from you. And, and they're like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's really awesome. Like, it's really, it's really fun for me to stay engaged with people. So thanks for the invitation. And, and let's talk about this. Um, let's talk about how you even get started. And that's one of the things that Jim talked about. The activity has changed so much. When I first started teaching, we picked our music and I gave it to the music writer and they wrote everything. Then they gave it to the drill writer and they did everything. And then we passed it on to the next person. And that doesn't happen anymore. And to make um, continuity in your production, you have to collaborate and you have to have your entire staff working together. So one of the things that we always did at Mason was we each had a role. Even though I know music, my role was visual at Mason. And when I taught the marching band, I wasn't allowed to make a music comment unless it was related to visual. And we all stayed in our little bubbles and, um, and we went from there. But just, you know, as you get started to design your program, note that you as the band director need to be able to coordinate all these people, the color guard, designer has to be able to talk with the um the drill writer the color guard designer even should be able to talk with the music arranger because they might have something that after you get that idea in your head of what you want to do they might have an idea that they want to portray and they need to talk to the music writer to, to make sure that the music is written to make that happen Susan, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Just for people who might be, you know, a band director only, for example, and, and they don't right. have a guard person, can and you sort of talk through um, how you develop, just going from the band director to what kind of staff you have so they have some sort of perspective? And maybe, I don't know if you can sort of talk through hierarchical, who, who is most important or, you know, that you need to have, but sort of talk through how that was at Mason so they have a frame of reference of what you're going from. Right. So. Um, so for instance, when I st first started at Mason, we actually had a very small staff. Um, there, it was a much smaller school and my previous schools that I, I was at was very small. So um, we basically tried to have, you know, our head band director and then we had one of the other band directors teaching the visual aspect of the program, um, teaching the basics and the fundamentals of marching. And then we had a percussion instructor and then we had a color guard person and that was really the bulk of our staff we usually would have maybe four people and some schools don't even can't even have that it's just the band director and and when i first started my career i taught at a school where we just brought a color guard person in for um for band camp to write the color guard work because that's what we did. And then I as a band director had to take that on and, and teach the color guard and make sure everything was um, happening. So, you know, what, what that did for me as a person is it made me more versatile. I actually worked really hard to um, be able to do anything so that I could be just me as a band director. I could teach color guard. I could teach any of the elements. Um, but as things developed in my career, and, and I was fortunate enough to have a larger program that had incredible parents who fundraised, we could add staff. So we used to, at Mason, we used to decide our own show concepts and pick our own music and things like that. But by the time I left Mason, <laughs> um, we had um, Wes Cartwright designed our show and he picked our music and our show concept. And we basically as the band directors then took that and our job was to teach it. And we actually took ourselves out of the design process. And so 
there's so many elements of it. So now what I'm trying to do for some people is give those band directors, some of the band directors in Ohio, that opportunity where I'm taking on that design aspect for them and I'm coordinating a music writer and a drill writer or I'm helping them pick the music. And it's all based on how much money they have to spend on their show. I work with one band that is in a location that every single student in that school is on free and reduced lunch. And I design their show with them and we work with the money that they have and we come up with some really cool things for them. And this past year was the first time they ever got a one at state. And it, I think that group is one of my favorite groups to work with because the joy in those kids' faces is amazing. It's, it's just so rewarding. And um, so I think that every level of band is important. And what all of you do, no matter whether you're doing a show band or a competition band, just whatever you do, you wanna try and do it the best you possibly can with the resources that you have. So, um, so let's kind of let's kind of talk through things like where do I start with um, finding a concept for a show? Um, nothing is right, nothing is wrong. Anything can be done. Um, I also take on the judges' role. I judge for Central States Judges Association, and I judge in Nebraska. And the thing that I'm still learning now that I'm a judge is. One thing that I see that a lot of people don't understand is that whatever concept you do, it has to be obvious to the judge. It doesn't have to be hard. Like if you're telling a story, it needs to be a story that you can portray, okay? It has to be something that you can get across to us both musically and visually. Um, I look at, as a judge, I look at the title of, the, of your shows. I make sure that I know what the title is because if I don't, I, I'm not giving you a service that you need. So you need to know that wherever you find your source, it has to be something that you can portray and anything can spark something in your brain. So for instance, I, um, I took a trip in November and I was snorkeling in Hawaii and this little picture of, <laughs> of this um, coral, I saw that coral in Hawaii and I was literally snorkeling and I went, oh my gosh, that's Lakota West show. And it just like, popped in my mind and I got out of the, like I got finished snorkeling, I went back to where I was staying and I just started writing ideas down of what I could do with it. So it doesn't matter, like any place you go. I saw um, one of my shows that I'm doing for a client this year, I was shopping in a little country store and I saw a little plaque and I read the phrase on it and I went, yes, that would be cool. So I just keep a tally on my, um, I, on my notes area on my phone. I just have this one document and I just, when I'm out and I see something that might spark something in my brain, I, I write it down and I go, oh, that's cool. Or I take pictures of things. So when I was in Vegas, I took pictures of these other two, the glass sculpture and the tree and the tree, I'm like, that would be great in Winter Guard, but I can't figure out how to use it outside, but it would be really neat if I could figure that out. And so I just, I explore things that way and I just take pictures and little things and then eventually my brain goes to, okay, this could be a neat idea. Um, I work. Would you, uh, would you forgive me for interrupting, please? Go ahead. I want to point out there's been some band directors uh, entering late. Uh, oh, okay. There's a link in the top of the chat that's got uh, the attachment uh, that Susan is referencing. Everybody, so you can see these photographs that she's mentioning right now. Uh, and I always forget to mention. Give me your email address and your name for professional development in the chat. Most everybody's doing it already, uh, but I, I should have said that earlier. Um, Susan, uh, can you, uh, for, forgive me again, if you're gonna mention this a little later okay. on, or if I'm taking you off track, then just tell me, hey, we don't have time. All right, it's all right. Can, but um, I'm curious. So I'm looking at the picture of your um, coral. <laughs> um, what show came out of that black piece of coral? What was the music? What what happened? 
Okay, so we're taking that show and we are um, calling it Ursula the Sea Witch. And, um, and that little coral is going to be their prop and there's gonna be three giant ones on there so that we have stages. And, um, and then we're going from there. So our whole thing is Ursula the Sea Witch. So actually you're leading me into my little next section of music. Um, so, um, so when I, I thought Ursula the Sea Witch, and, and so how do I find music for this visual idea? So one of the things I want you to know is sometimes my ideas come from a source of music. Sometimes my ideas come from a visual idea. And this one came from this. And so one of the pieces we're using is the Sorcerer's Apprentice because it's a it's a witch i think of ursula as a sorcerer and she controls the fish in the sea and um and plays with that so um so we i decided to go with that little segment in it and then um and then i'm always looking for beautiful ballads that um depict the the mood that I want. So I have this incredible son named Andrew, and he is a musician that um, graduated from New England Conservatory of Music, and he has this great knowledge of classical music. So I always, I'll call him and say, hey, I need something different, and I, and I, I need it to sound very ethereal and um, beautiful for a ballad, um, but also a little eerie because Ursula is not a very nice person. And I don't do wicked well because I'm very, um, I'm a very happy person. Um, so, so it's hard for me to think on the wicked part, but I'm actually doing this show to challenge me. And um, so my son came up with this incredible like flute concerto that he was in the orchestra with one time and it's it was perfect so i i sent it to the music writer and i said what do you think of this this is what i'm thinking um then what happened is which and this is something you always have to think about as you're creating i was planning on the flute solo because we had this girl that last year that played flute for them with, and I knew she was coming back and I'm like, this is going to be great. And then something happened in her schedule and now she can't be the soloist. So now I have to rethink that whole piece. And I went, okay, so who do you have that can play? So we're actually doing a, a flute concerto, but we're using a trumpet player on flugelhorn to make it, um, a different type of mood and so which, which, which flute can share from? which composer um i would have to look it up i can't even remember oh, off the top right. of my mind but um i'll put it in my notes I'll, I'll put it in my notes like after this so you guys can know um but but so i with their show went from a visual idea to a music idea but there are many shows that um I always talk with band directors and say, what's your favorite piece of music? Like, have you heard something lately that you like that maybe we can come up with a show for? And I put a link on here to this barbershop quartet of In the, Sh um, in the Shadows of the Bell Tower. And one of my um, schools, he heard this and he goes, I, I always wanted to do this. And so I went, oh, okay. And so I listened to it and then I came up with this idea of in the shadows of the bell tower. And so we kind of did this, um, we had a big shadow prop and, and there's a reference to this later. So you can, you can go lots of different ways, but I put on this, on this source material is um, this wind repertory project is something that has some, a great source for band literature and when I'm looking for music for a show, I go there first because I think it's important to include band literature um, for the kids. Um, but one of the things that is always important is you want to pick stuff that you know your kids are going to be successful playing at. 
this isn't a spot where you want to pick something that is going to be so ridiculous that they're not going to be able to play it. Because remember, we're not just asking them to play music, we're asking them to move and play music. So you've got to, you've got to pick very carefully. Um, other things that I do when I'm picking music is, um, <clears throat> is I'll, I'll Google search just moods and classical music. Like I said, I talk to my son about music. I talk to colleagues about music. I talk to the band directors and I say, hey, here's the mood that I need for your pieces. They're like, for instance, with the Ursula show that we're working on, I said to the band directors, hey, I'm gonna do something a little dark for you. I didn't want them to know the theme of their show yet. And I said, can you send me some um, music that might be dark that you would like to play? So we we're doing Toccata and Fugue um, by Bach in their show because they they like that, you know, selection. So so there you also want to have a connection to it. All right. You as a as a teacher want to have a connection to that music so that I think you're going to teach it better if you like it. All right. I, I just, I think you have to connect to everything that you're a part of. Um, I'm glad to hear you say that. I, I, I mean, I imagine some of the band directors that are listening, you know, when we, we talk about making judges happy, <laughs> of course, your whole career, you understand there's the Saturday judges and there's the Friday night judges. Yes. So, you know, the band parents and the community in a show that'll work when we take it out Saturday or on Tuesday evening. Our, our region assessments are on Tuesday evenings here in Arkansas. Okay. But, it, but of course, you know, unless we're one of those programs that has a Friday night show and a Saturday show, which is pretty rare, we know, mm -hmm. right. you know we want to find that sweet spot where it can work with both. Yeah. And, and that's, that's something that I think is really important. Um, and when I'm designing shows and I'm making decisions about shows and um, Mason thinks that's important and always has. And if you've ever watched some of their shows, they, they are very Friday night friendly for the most part. And, um, and we also at Mason on Friday night, we did a big pregame show, kind of like a college pregame show show style band because we think it's really important to connect to everyone in the community and so we actually you said a friday night or a saturday we actually had our friday night game show which really was um a show band type thing that because of what we were doing with our competition show our students could learn very fast. And there was an element of it that they absolutely loved. I think both, both things are important for them. And so they loved that. And then they did this high level competitive show. Um, so, and that is something that I think about with um, shows that I'm designing is, how's this gonna go at the football game? And, um, and you wanna make sure that you we're entertainers and we want the support of the community. And so you have to make sure that you're, you're finding that balance. Like I said, I'm going dark, but I'm going dark with Ursula, a Disney character. Right, right. Okay. So, so I'm not going to go much darker than that. I'm not going to go. No, it, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I taught in Illinois for many years and, and Greg Bims, one of my dear, dear, dear friends. And so, you know, everyone knows, I mean, Greg yes. goes dark. it's a show about Vietnam with headstones on the field. And Greg had a Friday night Beatles show because of that. Because yeah. you can't do that between the second and the third quarter of a football game. But, you know, one year he taught his entire band how to play clarinets just because he wanted to have 250 clarinets. Oh, on the yes. Field yes. Because it was amazing. <laughs> but and that's the extreme and, and and again i just imagine so I, I mean we i appreciate that you and mason seem to understand that as well and, and embrace that that um yeah there are judges that we care about their opinion but none more important than our community at home and being a part of that functional thing that happens on friday night and yourself you don't want to do you don't want to put yourself doing music that's going to be irritating to you 
you know, or a show that you don't enjoy. Like you're gonna spend months with it. The judge is gonna see it maybe once. <laughs> so right. you have to love it. And um, and so one of the things that I wanna talk about, talking about Greg Bim, you know, he has done so much himself through his whole career, writing his own music, writing his own drill. The man is a genius. And- The last <laughs> one ever. I mean, nobody will ever do it like Greg and, and the nicest person that you will ever meet, because I remember walking up to him and introducing myself for the first time, and he was more interested in finding about me, and I was more interested in finding about him and getting information from each other. And that's what's really cool. No one is not reachable. You have to put yourself out there, call people. It's okay to do that you know, and, um, and everyone, you know, when I was a young teacher, I constantly had to reach out to people. I'm an old teacher and I'm still reaching out because I'm in a new place where I'm designing. So I contact the people that were designing Mason shows and say, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this, this, and this, does that sound like a good idea? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, go for it. That sounds great. So you're always learning from people. So that's gonna lead me to my next little um, area on my music side is that you don't have to, there are so many, um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So this group that is doing the Ursula show a few years ago, when I first started working with them, they didn't have enough money to have music arranged for them. And so what we did was we went to one of these sites or several of these sites and I listened to music. I knew what we wanted to do for their show. And then I went to these sites of, of arrangers and I just listened to music and I picked three different movements and then we bought those movements and put them together into a show. That show made semi or, or made finals at several of the BOA regionals. They didn't, they didn't write an arranger to write a specific show. So you you have resources, you could go and just piece different movements from different shows together, which I will tell you because of the pandemic, I'm doing a lot of that for people this year because people <clears throat> are very worried about spending a lot of money on a season that might not happen. And so I'm doing a lot of that this year, of uh, picking from this person or getting three different movements, but coming up with an original visual idea. So don't feel like you can't do that. If you're in a situation where you can't afford to get a music arranger, maybe go that route. But I do have band directors, like one of my favorite little groups that I work with is my first job was at King's High School. And there, uh, that band director is, he writes a show every year because he knows how his kids play. And he's incredibly successful at it. So one of the things, so those little sources, those little um, places are just some that I, I talked about arrangers that um, are available, but there are so many and I'm sure you know some. So be okay with using those sites. We don't have to spend millions of dollars on this, okay? Some people have the, the ability to. So I do wanna show you this, um, I want you to think, try and think out of the box. And this is something that Wes Cartwright at Mason taught me so much. And this is one of, this is probably my favorite show that we ever did. The reason we did it, it was, um, we called it somewhere and we, we did West Side Story. And we actually, Wes asked, um, asked us what, what do, would you ever want to do? What would be your favorite thing? And we both said, oh, we would love to do a West Side Story show, but we really can't because you can't get the rights for, for it, for arranging the, the Bernstein. And he said, okay. And then a couple months later, we were doing somewhere. We found a middle school arrangement of somewhere that was beautiful. It was like a middle school, high school arrangement. And we did it verbatim because we had to, because you couldn't arrange it. We did it in our pre-show. And then we did West Side Story. And um, I have a little clip, a quick little clip. This is the Mambo section of 
the um, movie West Side Story in our show, but listen to what music we chose instead. Young person's guide to the orchestra, but it was the mambo. Like, so you have to you have to think about those things. And I I let that play, I let that one play a little bit because I just thought it was so creative. And um, and the whole show was like that. Like the opening section, the the friction section, we played Mars, you know. So um it was just, I, I learned so much that year from Wes because it made me actually rethink how I do things. And that's why now I'm doing a show about Ursula, but I'm not doing anything from Disney. It's all- oh, oh, Susan, forgive me. Let, let me, let me ask the question then. What, what does Benjamin Britten have to do with West Side Story? <laughs> how, did that, how did that work? What, right. What, what, how was that mambo? Right. How is that mambo? It was portrayed through the visual aspect of it. So, so the visual, it, you know, for people that know the West Side Story show, they know that that's the mambo was the dance section of the show. So obviously we, we portrayed that we were at the dance, you know, we had, if you, and this is why I kind of kept it going. If you saw the brass, they were stationary. They were hanging out in the gym over on site too, around their props while the color guard girls were dancing and doing the mambo and, and, and portraying the school dance. And then all of a sudden, the, um, the rest of the group started dancing. So, you know, we, we connected that back in. And, and those are the type of, types of things. Those little moments are so like, really? The, judge, <laughs> the judges were like, how did that just happen? You know, like, I get it, but how did you come up with that? Well, Wes is a genius, and, um, and, and, but we all have those capabilities of thinking like that. So last year's Lakota show, we did, um, a lot of people did the Bohemian Rhapsody thing. And our middle movement, we did, you know, the mama section of Bohemian Rhapsody, but, I put Ave Maria with it. And we, we intertwined the two, the classical with, with, the, um, with the rock piece. And, but yet it, it flowed together. It just meshed together. It was really pretty shocking. We were like, wow, this is so fun. And so you just have to, you have to think of, okay, how can I come up with this idea? Like how, what is different about it? How can I make it special? Cause let's face it, almost everything has been done already, but you have to come up with a way to do it differently. Susan, can I ask a question? And, and differently, but let's just point out, uh, those kids obviously played great and, <laughs> great. and so, Yes, you can you can do Mars in a West Side Story show mm -hmm. if they play great marching <laughs> and uh, move great and forget marching. I mean, we're in the twenty first century. Not not we're not marching. We're just we're moving great. They hopped around the the platforms great. Jim, I stepped on you. Yeah, no, you're fine. Hey, Susan, will you talk a little bit about um, one of the things that we've been doing for several years and arranging, which you alluded to a little bit, was we're starting to overlap pieces quite a bit. Like when you talked about 
Bohemian Rhapsody with Ave Maria. And I, I am doing that sometimes triple layering pieces on top. Um, and, and a lot of times with people who are starting out, like that thought is not necessarily occurring to them that they can overlap things. Like one of the things we did at Tech last year was overlapping uh, the Dies Irae with um, uh, Imagine Dragons something. I, I can't remember what the tune was and just sort of connecting it. Will you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. And how you approach that? I think it gives you a lot of depth in your music and I think it actually gives you some more connection that you can do within elements for um, for the musical aspect of your show. I, I think it's something that is very, as I will say, it's in right now. Um, it's something that a lot of people have started doing and, you know, we trend in marching band. So like we have some trends and one of them is this meshing some music together. But I do want to say this, is that as you mesh these things together, make sure you give both pieces and pieces a valid part of the show. Don't make it too short. One of the things that um, I, I was talking to Jody Rhodes, who, and she's a BOA judge, one of the things that she, she also um, design. She said one of the things that the BOA judges and judges in general are concerned about is we're doing too many snippets of music and not fulfilling the, the integrity of the piece. And so um, we're musicians. We need to make sure that we fulfill that integrity of that. Right. And, and I think the thing I would add on top of that too is a lot of times when it's, when it's too segmented like that, if it's too snippet oriented, it doesn't allow the music to develop. And that's one of the things that we miss a lot of is that musical development. It, it's a lot of times it's just impact, impact, impact with no development. But that's something that I think Mason has been wonderful. At. The development really is what creates, you have the moments, but the development is what creates the, the intensity and the go into the moment. Yeah, and the content of, of what you want to do. And um, so I'm, I'm looking at my, at my clock and I'm worried we're not going to get to any visual stuff. So I'm going to start getting into that a little bit. I'm going to connect it to the music if we can. And so one of the things that I always do is um, I talk to the music arrangers about the visual ideas. So um, I, I have someone working on a show right now and I said, okay, so it's a different group. I said, said, where are you on the ballad? I have like, this needs to happen. I need the brass to not play at the beginning and it needs to be a soloist introducing this themes because I need the brass to be in kayaks rowing boats here and um <laughs> and they're like okay and I said so you have to write this this ballad for me so that we can go on kayaks well, a solo's coming, bring the woodwinds in, and then I got to get the brass up and off out of the field and have the big moment. And so, so I talk to the music arrangers about my intent visually that I see to, to have the moments that are going to make you special and make you memorable. And this, this, is, this is in your role as program coordinator, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. So I to, to talk about how I, I imagine most of our uh, colleagues here, they're their program coordinator. Right, you are your program yeah. coordinator. So you so are, are we are we having a storyboard meeting with our yeah. with Definitely. our junior faculty, with our color guard staff, our drumline person? Are we planning Everybody's, out? Moments? Yes. Everyone is on that, and all of those meetings now are on Zoom. So I spend a lot of time on Zoom. Um, <laughs> But we, we all sit down together and we talk through, okay, this is what this movement is about and this is the special moment that we want to have happen. And so the music writer then knows, and this is the music that we want it to happen to. And we take the original and we plan it around that music and then they write to that. Then it gets passed on to the visual you know designer who's doing our drill and i'm like okay so you have to think ahead that this next movement i've got to have those kids on kayaks at the beginning so where are we ending up here 
And, and we plan it out the whole show. The visual moments have to be planned out for the whole show. I think a lot of- Do you of use any kind of technology for that? Is it old fashioned, uh, like uh, just, deli paper? A I used, lot of I us- Draw okay. things on big, you, long deli paper with- You're with gonna paper. laugh. And, and I can say this because I know other people that do this. So this is, I literally will, if I, I was working with um, one of my drill writers and I literally took a note, piece of notebook paper, just a piece of computer paper. I draw a picture on it and I put this circle it. This is the color guard. This is this, this is what this is. And so, and I show it to them over and then I'll, I'll scan it and send it to them. And I'll say this, at this point, this is what the drill leans to look like because and so we map out those moments and so and then the drill writer connects to those moments is there a formula about those moments do they happen <laughs> on the timeline yes <laughs> yes there's definitely a formula about them um, <laughs> and so one of and that that's one of the things that's key with our music arranger also is to make sure that they write to that formula and so that they know when it's going to happen and and here's you know as we as we continue this discussion you can't be afraid to change also because sometimes the formula doesn't work so like we took out probably 64 counts out of the ballad on October 26th one year or actually this past year with Lakota they were going to Grand Nationals, it was their second time ever. And I went, you know, the ballot pacing, it's, we're just, we're losing it. It's just a little too long. We're gonna, we're gonna cut 64 counts out. And we- I think this is a huge opportunity. How, how did you know that that was a decision you guys needed to make? Um, I got bored when I was watching it. Yeah, okay. It was lost my there, interest. Was there feedback was there feedback as well. And there was feedback like from a from from judges and um and we just we couldn't sustain and this is important in a ballad we couldn't sustain that um that music for that long we didn't have the physical ability as players to sustain it. So we had to get to the arrival quicker so that the kids could achieve the music with the visual because it wasn't sustainable for them. They just physically couldn't do it. And, and so by the time they got to the impact point, we had no impact because we had exhausted them through the visual aspect of it. And so we had to make that change. And I will tell you that I truly believe they would, they made semifinals for the first time um, in their career. And I think they wouldn't have if we hadn't made that change on October 26th. Like, and so you uh, can't be afraid to do that. It's, it's a great segue. We've got Beth Fabrizio next week. <laughs> and Beth is going to do an, a, a judge's kind of a workshop. It, it, hers is a little bit of a, okay, here's everything I wish I could say on your recording. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but, right. and, you know, I think that's, I think that's a great segue to next week where if you've been hearing some things on recordings, yeah, may, maybe once in a while, it's time to just say, no, we're right. I'm going to stick with what we designed in July. Or maybe you can <laughs> let it go yeah. and make a change and, and it'll be better in the long run um and and i will tell you and so um let's let's jump into because this leads into a little story on my visual prop things is um the what the wedding show year with um with mason where we used if you see the picture of the um blow up groom um a hysterical prop which made us very memorable people were like we can't believe they're they're throwing around you know blow up grooms all over <laughs> the, the show. Um, and Cam came down just to get a picture with, with one, you know, so props can make you memorable, all right, as we continue to talk about how do we stand out. But that year, two weeks before Grand Nationals, 
it wasn't working. The end of the show wasn't working what we had planned out. And so we had to scrap it and we rewrote the entire ending. And we were doing that. We were learning some of it right before it was the week of Grand Nationals. We were finishing learning it because we aren't afraid to change because I will tell you that your students will take it on. They love, they love the fact that you care and you realize something's not quite right, let's fix it, because that's true in life. And so they'll take it on and they'll take on that challenge and they'll, they'll fix it. So I, I think that, you know, visually, you always have to think of at least three things that are gonna make you stand out from other groups. I try and do more, but here's what I find a lot of people make the mistake of. We start our show in you know, July, August. We're very invested in the opener. We come up with great ideas. By the time we get to the closer, we've lost what we really, the intent was. And we have no more ideas. So I, when I work on these storyboards with people and we're planning out their show, I figure out what is going to be the last thing that we do that is going to be the memorable thing. And then I work the other things out through the beginning for the visual aspect for that memory. So props can be a great thing, a great source. And I don't know if any, did any of you see the Mustang band from Oklahoma with the dinosaurs this year? Just hysterical. So if you haven't seen them, I've got a real quick, um, clip of them. They were in rehearsal. I couldn't find a good one on YouTube. So I actually reached out and got a cute clip on, um, on them. So Jim, can you play the little dinosaur clip? And five, six, five, six, seven, eight, step and touch and step and touch and bounce, two, three, four, step together, out, hold, five, six, seven, eight, step together, out, hold, five, six, seven, eight. Like, how fun is that? Like, <laughs> like, this band director actually had a difficult time because they have, I call them shadows. I don't call them alternates. I call them shadows because they're, sh when we had um, um, alternates slash shadows at Mason, we called them shadows because they were shadowing an upperclassman and learning how to do things. And um, so these were their shadows and their people that were marching, they wanted to be the dinosaurs. And they were like, can I be a dinosaur instead? <laughs> and so I, what a, a great way to keep those kids involved and, and to do that. So I just thought that was a great idea of a prop. And you can do creative props that will stand out like our blow up groom, or we've had we use those knocker balls that they play soccer, you know, those big giant balls that you can fit in and, and we've used those. So as you're walking around life, if you see something and you're like, that's really funny or that's really cool, it could be a prop. But I encourage you to use those props. We've gotten past the stage of those props just sitting as a background. How can you use the prop? And, um, and so, and, and maybe even consider them as setting up different stages within the show, which we, we, um, we worked a lot with as we kept developing at Mason. And um, so, but what I also want to say that we don't want to lose track of the past of bands. So if you look at my pictures, um, visual moments are set up by memorable moments for you. So who doesn't love a snowman? And that snowman built one piece at a time. So like all of a sudden, like the head of the snowman was there and you weren't really sure what it was. And then it built and then it built and all of a sudden it was a snowman and the audience just went, oh, and you hear a reaction from the audience. And that's when you go, oh, that worked. <laughs> okay. And, but you have to, like, this is a great thing that we can learn from our show bands in the fact that let's not lose the past of marching band. Let's connect 
let's connect it together. And so um, just even our wedding show, you can see down that bottom picture, I love you. People thought that was really cute. They were like, oh, neat, you know, things like that. Or hit the other emotion where this, the center picture was when um, Tony died at the end of West Side Story. And there, there's every emotion that you can hit with people during any show. And this one was devastation. And I have never heard um, or been in an arena where at the end of a show, no one clapped. It was just completely silent because everyone was taking in that emotion. And, and my favorite moment of that show was one of the visual, the visual um, judge, when I heard his tape, he actually was crying. He had to stop judging because it affected his emotion. So we are, as I said, we're performers. We wanna reach out to the audience. We can't forget about them. They're, they're really important. That's why we do it. And so you've gotta find these visual things that can connect you. Um, and then, Jim, I think we have time to at least do this next clip really quick of, um, of the wedding show. This kind of combines a, um, a musical moment because we can make musical moments too. The moments aren't just visual. And remember, we're band directors. We want to teach music. So this is a music moment in the snow show. Um, the first time we ever did a woodland feature. And, um, and I'm actually going to talk about how I would actually state or I would layer it differently or texture it differently now than I would have back in 2011. So. First of all, how do you get woodwinds to play like that? Well, I have this incredible person, Zach Henson, who teaches at Mason, and he's got a formula of how he teaches that. Call him and find out how he does it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, how you, that's how you learn from people. He shares it. I've had him share it with every one of my clients. I'm like, I need, I need help here. And he, he gives them the information. So you, you call them and you say, hey, I heard that. But so as we looked at that, um, the woodwinds, they, they were staged, in my opinion, now that I look back at that, they were staged too high. Um, but I've learned um, through time, you know, we, we put some texture in it, but it was the first time we had ever done that difficult of a woodwind feature or any woodwind feature, really, to be very honest. And, um, and so we were afraid to have them go into the ground. We thought it would harm their, their music. But what it did was it didn't give the color guard members were there. And that's who we wanted people to watch was the color guard. Well, the woodwinds got in the way. All we needed to do really was just take those woodwinds down to a knee. And that would have probably been easier than texturing all those pots. <laughs> and we would have seen it. <laughs> so we actually made our, our job harder. And, um, and um, but now I know not to do that. But it takes through time that, that you learn these things. But um, which leads me into, you know, my, my next little thing of, you know, drill designing and planning the focus and your drill designer and you have to work together. So at that moment, we were supposed to focus on the color guard. So they had he, they had the um, woodwinds and pods so there was space available for the color guard. So that was awesome. But all I needed to do was take them down to a kneel and it would have been so much better and so much more effective. Um, that's something that um, just to share with you a little bit, we, we have little trick. I have little tricks that I do. Every time we kneel, um, we kneel the exact same way. We we go down two, three, up two, three, we have the same like shape every time we kneel. So when we're working on a part of the show and we have written it so that the color guard is um, 
is within the winds, I can just say, everyone, you're taking a kneel on counts five, six, seven, and the kids can just do it. We teach it in marching basics. And so we can add that from, from the box. And, and Susan, we have, a, we have a question in the chat. If you can oh. remind everybody, uh, say that the woodwind guy that they could contact for. Uh, oh, Zach, Zach Hinson is his name. Um, H-I-N-S-O-N. And you can actually go to um, the Mason website and, and find him if you go to masonbands.com and just reach out to him and he'll, he'll send stuff to you. So yeah, he's, he's awesome at his methodology. And I know he already has it written out of how he does it because he has shared it with some of my, some of his colleagues here in Ohio. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So texturing and layering is, is really important. And, you know, all of you as band directors, you know, one of the things I want to talk about is, you know, a trend is now we all dance. We don't just march, we dance. And, and none of us learned to dance <laughs> in, in college unless you were able to take a dance class. Now, I took dance when I was younger, so this was great news for me. I loved it. I thought it was awesome. Um, but most of my colleagues in Ohio were not happy when dance prepared. And so where, where can you learn it? How do you, how do you do this? And I still do this and everyone laughs at me, but I go online, I go on YouTube and I take bar classes. I go online and I take exercise classes and I was doing an Alcatraz show for a client and I went online and did kickboxing and most of their body was from a kickboxing, kickboxing video. And um, Michael Rosales, who um, he is a he writes for a lot of people, but Santa Clara Vanguard, he, he does all their body. He is starting a new thing next summer. It was supposed to start this summer, but it's gonna start next summer because of the situation. But he's actually going to have a class that you guys can go to and, um, and learn body basics. And he's doing it for students, but he's also doing a director level thing first time that I think that's out there so hey Susan we've got we've got like two minutes left do you want to hit color and uniform real quick and we'll show this Lakota clip if you want um yeah so um the first thing I want you to know is that once again I keep saying we don't have to reinvent the wheel and for those of you that might not have the money there are lots of places you can get uniforms so this um picture of this color guard down here and the animals those we spent, I think, $50 on those uniforms at the most. Um, we, um, we, had, um, we just bought a unitard and we went and found an, uh, um, an artist that did the spraying, the spray art on them. And that's how we made those uniforms and they were incredible and very inexpensive, but you can rebuy them. So like, there's also, that's something that is really important right now is, you know, the flag swap and, and shop in all of these places. And I, I put some on pink, like buying uniforms for cheap and have beautiful uniforms or go to band websites. They, a lot of the larger bands resell stuff. So go ahead and do that. But the big thing is, is how do you find colors and things? I, if I see a great outfit, I go to Vegas all the time and I walk around the malls in Vegas and then if I see a great color combination on a dress or an outfit, I take a picture and I'm like, I'm gonna use this in a show. You don't have to do it all yourself. Use what you see. <laughs> Okay, so that's, that's really, really important and, um, and an easy way to do it, but also use what you have. So Lakota West just got new uniforms last year, and this was actually an accident, what you're going to see. It's going to be in the back right corner. The brasses, they were really far back, and they were set up for body, and I'm like, how can I bring attention to them? So I just kept flipping them back and forth, and you're going to see a color change. They're in a block in the back, so we're going to show this really quick. So, that's the thing that they were doing and 
so I just kept flipping them back and forth and flipping them back and forth so that your eye got drawn to them. And they were so far back field. And I went, oh my gosh, I actually did it. And then we put the uniforms on and I was like, yes, that worked. And um, so just weird things like that happened. So then once I saw that that worked and their uniform worked that way, now I'm actually designing parts of their show this year to use the use the back of their uniform as a stage. Susan, any any closing thoughts? We're we're out of time. Any big picture closing thoughts or a big um, few points that you had? My big thing is is that don't be afraid to learn from people. Don't be afraid to reach out to people and ask questions and um and don't be afraid to like just do everything. You've got to coordinate everyone together. You're your coordinator. And just, it's not about people hurting people's feelings. It's about doing what's right for the students to make them great. So just don't be afraid. If you don't like something, you got to be able to say it to a person. And so you want to surround yourself with people that you can say anything to. Like they used to say no to me at Mason sometimes with some of my, my stuff. <laughs> and I would go, are you sure? And they'd go, yeah, it, it doesn't work with our music because we can't play and do it. And I'd go, okay, I'll make it easier. And I had to make it easier. Yeah. yeah. You have to be able to do that and you have to be able to hear that that idea that you had that you thought was going to be perfect, maybe is not. Maybe isn't. Yep. And that's okay, because ultimately you're trying to make the kids successful and have a great experience. Well, it, it's more than okay. Maybe it's required. I mean, we <laughs> talked about, yep. we talked about Greg once, and you mentioned how there are times in October, you guys have been changing things at Mason. I mean, Greg's legendary for putting drill on the field in Indianapolis in November. In November, yeah. He'll, he'll be changing constantly. And that's what the summer teams do yep. too, uh, yep. because I mean it's it's probably unreasonable to think that you're ever going to get something great, well, perfect, right out right. of the incubator. Whether that's winter time, springtime, early summer, early fall, uh, it's going to be a, an evolutionary fluid process, and and uh, sometimes we have to let those things go and 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 move on to other things. Uh, Susan, this could have been all ten weeks. I know. <laughs> There's so much to cover. So. <laughs> and I so appreciate it. I know how hard it must have been for you to try to take something that's your life's work and you're so passionate about and put in an hour. Um, the handout's wonderful. Um, is your email address on that handout? Could directors will, reach out to you? I will add it to it and, um, and send it to Jim. But yes, I'll definitely put my email on there. And I'm on Facebook if you want to find me on Facebook too. You can always friend me and um, I am always available. Okay. I'm always and, available. And can I add guys in the audience, Susan is wonderful. I mean, she, she will take the time to help you and talk you through things. Susan, I might be giving you more work. I'm sorry, but she, she is absolutely, she is approachable. <laughs> she's fantastic and reach out to her. I mean, she'll, and if she doesn't know, she'll point you to someone who does. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's important that we help each other. Well, it's all, it always has been, and, and our profession has been one of the great things about it is that, I, I mean, I've never asked a band director and he told me, or she told me, just get out of my face. I'm not going to help you. Right. I, I don't think that person exists. Um, as we said, Greg's the nicest person you'll ever meet. Um, everybody that's good at this knows that they stole good ideas from geniuses around them, too, and... Uh, so that's that's always been the case. I think in this weird world we're in now, it's going to be even more important than ever, and people are already stepping up. So like you, Susan. So again, thanks. on behalf of everybody that's here, thanks for taking the time to help us all out and share with us. And Thank we're you. all grateful for a new friend in you. Thanks very much. I wish you all the best. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right, everybody, maybe we'll take, uh, let's see, I got 5.06. Let's take a three or four minute leg stretch. And then I think Dr. Reed is here and he will teach us about the wonderful world of God's instrument, the trombone. Awesome. Bye everyone. Thank you. <laughs>